Welcome to the Warwick Classics Network session on the imperial image Augustus, in his own words, Reis Gestae Dewi Augusti. Um, does everyone have the handout before I get going? Great. Okay, so you can follow the structure of the lecture uh, on the handout with, with references. So the Reis Gestae is, of course, the text produced by Augustus at the end of his life, and it offers an impression of how he wanted to be remembered and what he wanted to be viewed as his main achievements. Um, I'm aiming to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, allowing time for questions at the end, and I want to focus on the context of the Reis Gestae in the city of Rome, uh, both physically as a monument and politically in terms of Augustus's self-image in the capital. Um, I want to start by thinking about the document's initial reception, how it created a particular image of Augustus, and at the end, I want to spend a few minutes outlining some of the most recent scholarship on Augustus. Um, above all, what I want to do is to focus on the historiographical challenges posed by the dominance of the Reis Gestae as the historical source relating to the age of Augustus. Of course, one of the big problems that we have is the lack of surviving contemporary histories. Although we know that the likes of Commutus Cordus and Asinius Pollio wrote histories of their own times, these don't survive. And that's probably not a coincidence. Um, Tacitus says, uh, there was no lack of people of fair talent for telling of the times of Augustus until they were scared off by the flattery that was swelling up. So one of the real problems that we have in approaching the race gestae is the, is the question of detecting historical bias in the way that Augustus spins his tale. So to start with, um, the initial publication of the Reis Gestae. So we all think of it as an inscription, but I think it's important to realise that the first time the inscription was published in any form was that it was read out as a speech. So at the first meeting of the Senate after Augustus' death in AD 14, Tiberius' son, the younger Drusus, read out to the Senate Augustus' will and three further documents. Uh, the first of these issued instructions about his funeral. The second was a summary of his achievements, the Index Rerum Arce Gestarum. And the third contained a brief account of the whole empire, the Breviarium Totius Imperii. But Augustus's intentions for the text extended beyond that initial audience of senators. He gave explicit instructions for it to be displayed carved on bronze outside his mausoleum. Now the mausoleum was not just a wonderful tomb for Augustus himself, but it was very much a dynastic monument. Strabo, who's a direct contemporary, calls it the so-called mausoleum. And the reason for that sort of periphrasis is of course that the real mausoleum, as everyone knows, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world of King Mausolus at Halicarnassus. So, there was a sense in which calling Augustus's mausoleum the mausoleum was already telling you things about Augustus's uh, desire to be seen as founder of some sort of ruling dynasty. Um, already before Augustus ended up being buried there himself, we'd already seen the burials of Marcellus, Octavia, Agrippa, Drusus the Elder, Gaius and Lucius. So again, the sense that it's a family dynastic monument was already clear uh, well before AD 14. Relatively recently, Sylvia Panchera also published a series of uh, fragmentary inscriptions found in the mausoleum, which actually record mini Reis Gestae of other members of the imperial family. Um, so we've got records, um, unfortunately, just fragments of senatorial decrees in honor of Gaius and Lucius, fragments of inscriptions in honor of Agrippa, Drusus, Gaius, and Lucius. And these, like Augustus's Reis Gestae, also show an emphasis on warfare and foreign conquest, which is, of course, what the Latin phrase Reis Gestae in its traditional sense is all about. It's all about going and beating up the barbarians. But, of course, the Reis Gestae, as well, is very much concerned with the personal achievements of Augustus. And this was also encapsulated in the monumental decoration of the mausoleum. Um, so, the, again, fragmentary architectural remains have been discovered. On the left, you can see carved in stone um, imitation laurel trees. 
So just like the ones that are outside Augustus's house on the Palatine, um, where there are real laurel trees planted, his mausoleum somehow also incorporated carved laurel trees. And on the right, this may look a bit unexciting, but it is really exciting, this inscription, <laughs> um, because you can see it's actually a, a roundel, and this is a copy on stone of the golden Clipea Suitutis that was um, given in honor of Augustus in the Senate House. And before, now, before this fragment, we had the big marble copy at Arles, but we didn't have a trace of the, the monument at Rome. So it's very interesting that Augustus's mausoleum also alluded to some of the previous honours given to Augustus uh, in other contexts. Here's a, a reconstruction by John Pellini, which I think gives a good sense. So here we've got, he suggests the Clipeus Vitutis may have been above the doorway, and um, maybe the doorway was flanked by these uh, stone laurel trees. And this is how he envisages the display of the Reis Gestae. Uh, notice um, also we've got these obelisks, which of course is an allusion to the capture of Egypt and the beginning of, um, of, of Augustus's domination of the known world. So, moving on to the text itself. I think that right from the start, world conquest is the message that's foremost in the way that the text is presented to us. Um, here you've got the, the heading. Now, admittedly, the heading can't have been written by Augustus himself because not even Augustus would have called himself the deified Augustus. But I don't think that he would have objected to this as a summary of what the Reis Gestae is all about. So one of the main messages, I think, that comes out of the Reis Gestae is the message that Augustus has conquered the world, not even the Mediterranean world, quite simply the whole known world he regarded as subject to the rule of the Roman people. And this is sort of worked through in the text of the Reis Gestae through the fact that if you go through counting them up, you find there are 55 geographical terms in the Reis Gestae, the exotic names of foreign kings, chieftains and princes, uh, eastern potentates in Armenia and Parthia, all represented as being led by Rome including the likes of Tigranes, son of Artavasdes, Ariobarzanes, son of Artavasdes, and British kings. And you remember that Britain at this point is not even a, a direct province ruled by Rome. Um, and here's a particular tour de force, I feel, where we read of the kings of the Parthians, namely Tiridates and later Phraates, son of King Phraates, Artavasdes, king of the Medes, etc., etc. Um, these all sound fairly weird and wonderful to us. Um, how much more weird and wonderful would they have seemed to the contemporary Romans? This roll call of these exotic places that are now under Rome's sway, even if perhaps they're not officially part of the Roman Empire. And above all, this really contrasts with the, con with the lack of Roman names. Um, it's notorious in the Reis Gestae that apart from naming consuls, um, as, as dating formulae and naming some family members, Augustus's name is the dominant name in the text. So you've got the contrast between all these exotic uh, individuals being named and the lack of any other contemporary Roman other than Augustus being highlighted in the text. There's also an emphasis on new areas of the world being opened up under Augustus's leadership as, for instance, his fleet explored the northern expanses of ocean. Um, and you can see in this passage here how there's very much an emphasis on the fact that no Roman previously had even been to this area. Um, the emphasis on the Pannonians being subdued, um, a people whom the Roman army had never previously even approached. Everything is done for the first time. And one of my favourite bits is Augustus also talks about envoys coming all the way from India to Rome to see him for the very first time in Roman history. So Augustus does literally mean that he, as far as he understands it, he has influence, even if he hasn't got direct rule, over the whole known world. Of course, 
The other great world conqueror that we all know about is Alexander the Great. And I think there's very much the subtext in the Reis Gestae of Augustus uh, pointing the finger at Alexander and saying, well, you think he's great, but, you know, I've actually done even better. Um, and I think this is underlying um, this short sentence. He talks about uh, an area enclosed by ocean from Gades up to the mouth of the River Elbe. And, of course, Alexander died before he actually managed to get as far as the Pillars of Hercules at Gades, uh, modern Cadiz. So by just alluding casually to this, Augustus is really thumbing his nose at Alexander, I feel. Um, and the other parallel that we see in the Reis Gestae is that when Augustus talks about the embassy <coughs> coming to him from India, which actually reached him while he was at Tarico in northwestern Spain, this is a mirror image of the embassy of envoys who travelled from the west to Alexander while he was in the east. So you've got this nice parallelism and competition going on between Augustus and Alexander. So world conquest is definitely, in my view, the number one message of the Res Gestae. But I think there are other messages that we can trace as well. Um, one is the importance of claiming that he had restored and revived uh, traditional Roman religion. Um, so here we've got a simple list, where it seems simple, but of course Augustus is the first person in Roman history to be a member of every single uh, major priesthood and every minor priesthood and to have revived some extra ones for good measure as well. Um, he reminds us of the fact that he celebrates the Ludi Saecularis, the Centennial Games, that he closes the gates of Janus and that he, he restores uh, 82 temples. So he's very much insistent on the importance of the fact that he's restored uh, religion. This is not just a question of him showing how pious he is, because of the, very much the Roman idea that if you, are, if you have the gods on your side, you will therefore you know, have the ability to conquer other people. You need the gods' support to be a successful Roman. So I think this is, again, why you get the emphasis on religion in a text which is also very much about world conquest. Another theme um, is the transformation of the city of Rome. Um, this is something, of course, that everybody talks about, about Augustus since um, Pal Zanker's uh, The Power of Images book. But in the course of chapters uh, 19 to 21, he spends three paragraphs on temples, uh, political structures like the Senate House, and spaces for the benefit of the plebs, including the Theatre of Marcellus, uh, the Theatre of Pompey, a lake for the mock sea battle, the Forum with the Temple of Mars the Avenger. What's particularly interesting is that Augustus only talks about his building projects in the city of Rome. Uh, by contrast, in the appendix to the Reis Gestae, which appears to have been composed in the Greek East by provincials. That then talks about his other building works, his money given to colonies, municipalities, and towns destroyed by earthquake or by fire. So somebody somewhere has thought, it's a bit odd that Augustus only talks about the city of Rome. We think he's missing a trick. We, th we think it's also important that he's done things to benefit the provinces. So it's interesting that we almost have a sort of a critique of Augustus's self-representation, the things that he, he decided to leave out then appear in uh, the inscribed form in the appendix at the end. One of my particular hobby horses um, is that Augustus did not restore the Republic. Um, any textbook that says that should now be officially banned, burned, <laughs> condemned to hell. Um, what he really was claiming was that he restored constitutional government. So he was very, very adamant that the, pro the normal processes of government were being respected by him. This immediately fits in uh, with his use of consular dates throughout, because, of course, this is the standard way of dating um, in a respectful way that acknowledges the two uh, premier magistrates of Rome from year to year. Um, so here we've got um, this example here, um, where you can see he alludes to the consulship of Marcus Marcellus and Lucius Aruntius. 
there's also an edict which Suetonius records in his biography. And although there's a, a great deal of stuff in Suetonius which isn't historical, I think in the case of the life of Augustus, there are also hints of genuine documents. Um, for instance, Suetonius mentions at one point that he's seen Augustus's handwriting. Um, we know that um, Suetonius was, was Hadrian's ab epistolis, or sort of um, archives uh, secretary. So it seems very likely that when he says, uh, this is a quotation of an edict of Augustus, that this is actually a genuine uh, historical document and we can treat it as such. And you can see that in his own words, what Augustus wanted to be remembered for was as the originator of the best order, um, the optimi status auctor, laying lasting foundations for the state, the fundamenta re publicae. He's not saying, I am setting up a new political regime, nor is he saying, I am restoring the republic. He's just saying, I want the state to be um, prosperous and to be constitutional. And uh, I don't know whether Claire's going to talk about this coin later, um, but the same message appears on uh, contemporary coinage as well. Um, this is a coin minted in 16 BC by Lucius Mascinius Rufus, which depicts, as you can see, just about on the obverse, an inscription within an oak wreath commemorating the fulfillment of a vow uh, to Jupiter for the health of Augustus. Uh, because, and it's highly abbreviated, but it seems clear that it says, because through him the state is in a greater and more peaceful condition. So this is, this is what Augustus was doing to the Roman constitution. He very much wanted to be regarded as um, following the lead of the ancestors or the maiores. So when he talks about um, his opening of the gates of Janus, sorry, his closing of the gates of Janus, this was in accordance with the wishes of the maiores. Um, here he's talking about um, his decision not to make Armenia a province. And he says, I preferred, in accordance with the example um, set by our ancestors, um, to keep it as a, as a client kingdom. Um, similarly, he talks about uh, the fact that he had accepted no magistracy contrary to ancestral custom. Um, so, in other words, he wasn't prepared to take the perpetual dictatorship because there was no good precedent in the Roman constitution for that to be an acceptable post. Uh, similarly, he says that he rejects the post of the guardian of laws and customs, uh, the curator morum. Um, at times, he also implies that he has due regard for tradition in the religious sphere. So, for instance, in turning down the opportunity to be elected Pontifex Maximus while the, the uh, office holder Lepidus was still alive. Um, you can see here, note he avoids naming Lepidus. We know that's who he means. Um, but he, he insists that this is, uh, it's appropriate, it's in accordance with uh, the custom for him to wait until Lepidus had died before being elected as, as the priest. So Augustus very much gives the impression that he values the traditional instruments of government at Rome in the form of the Senatus Populusque Romanus. The Senate and people of Rome are often portrayed as the initiators of significant actions or as expressing their support for Augustus. So together, it's the Senate and people of Rome who offer Augustus the posts of dictator. They offer him the post of guardian of laws and customs, even though he ends up turning that down. Uh, they authorize him to increase the number of patricians. They're the ones who vote honors for Gaius and Lucius and dedicate the shield of, honor, shield of virtue in his honor. And then in a significant deviation at the end, uh, together with the equestrian order, so it's the Senate, the equestrian order, and the Roman people, hail Augustus as father of the fatherland. In the course of the Reis Gestae, uh, decrees of the Senate are mentioned explicitly 11 times. And on other occasions, the Senate's also depicted as, as the instigator of actions. So in a funny way, what Augustus is doing is he's saying, I'm simply carrying out the will of the Senate, the will of the people. Um, he's not himself supreme ruler. Um, and this is where I have problems 
even with calling Augustus emperor or monarch. And one of the things that I try to get my students to do is to avoid talking about the reign of Augustus, because this gives... Yeah, I don't think Augustus would actually want to be uh, remembered as someone who had a reign. Um, and there's also an emphasis in the Reis Gestae upon the universal support that he enjoyed. Moving on now to think about the language of the Reis Gestae. Um, the style of the text very much encourages us to believe um, that somehow it's an objective historical record. It's written in very concise, what we might even call lapidary style. Lots of lists, lots of statistics, um, lists of exactly what buildings in the city of Rome he's built and restored, exactly what priesthoods he held. And through giving very precise statistics, it gives the impression of precision. So here we've got the census figures in chapter 8. Uh, 4,063,000, then 4,233,000, then 4,937,000. When he talks about the donatives in chapter 15, he says, uh, I gave in 44 BC to the Roman plebs 300 sesterces apiece. Uh, then 400 sesterces in 29 BC, 24 BC, and 12 BC, uh, that my donatives never reached fewer than 250,000 men, and that in 5 BC uh, he gave 60 denarii each to 320,000 of the urban plebs. So it would take a strong-minded individual to say, actually, uh, this isn't what he did, because it's, it's the, the rhetoric of number, the way in which he's giving the impression that you can trust what he's saying, because it's, you know, lies and statistics go back even to Roman times. Um, he also deliberately echoes um, formal official constitutional language in talking about his position in the state. Um, so in talking about his position as a triumvir, he has the whole formal title of Triumvirum Republicae Constituendi. Um, and so he's inserting his political career into what appears to be the traditional framework for the state. And he very much chooses his words carefully in order to create a positive impression of his position in the state. But his centrality to the Reis Gestae is even grammatical. As you all have spotted, it's written in the first person. And that's quite unusual for a, an inscription of this type. Um, and through the insistence on the first person, the syntax conveys the unambiguous message that Augustus is absolutely central to the state. The whole text is written in the first person. We also get the repetition and emphatic positioning of the adjective meus throughout. Um, and what's, what I think is particularly uh, interesting is that the personal tone that this creates masks what is in fact the revolutionary novelty of, of what Augustus was actually up to. Um, so, for instance, he talks about my army, the executus meus, and my fleet, the classis mea. Um, he then also talks about the veterans as being my soldiers, the militum maiorum. And on the face of it, that sounds very traditional and republican, the idea that the commander has some sort of personal relationship with the soldiers serving under him. But of course, Augustus is the first person. This applies to the whole Roman army, not just the troops um, levied under his banner. And what you can see from, from this uh, chapter is the way in which he slips from talking initially about an army of the Roman people, and then he slips in section two to talking about um, that they performed under my auspices. And then all of a sudden we're in the world of, oh, it's become my army. And I think this really shows the steps by which he sort of elides the idea of the army being the army of the Roman people to make it into an army which is, um, who owe their allegiance specifically to Augustus. So now we need to tackle the knobbly question of, does it tell nothing but the truth? Um, how trustworthy are the Reis Gestae? Who would know 
if it was telling porky pies. You know, in the past, some people have said, oh, well, it was on public display, therefore it can't lie, it can't distort the truth. Um, the status as an inscribed text evokes this world of inscriptions as somehow um, being the objective truth. Um, I don't know whether any of you remember this, but in the 1990s, ASDA had their price promise uh, displayed and engraved on these pseudo inscriptions at the front of every store. And again, it was playing with this idea, you can trust us. Uh, of course, I think it's hilarious that they were then taken over by Walmart and that was the end of that. Um, so it, it just goes to show you can't really trust what an inscription says. But even in the modern world, we still have this um, fundamental belief that somehow inscriptions don't lie. So let's try and catch him out. Uh, first of all, thinking about his claim about the Battle of Philippi, or in fact the battles of Philippi, because there were two battles, one at Philippi, one on the 3rd, and one on the 23rd of October, 42 BC, uh, against, of course, Brutus and Cassius. Now, in the first battle, uh, both sides were partially victorious. Antony defeated Cassius, who then committed suicide in the mistaken belief that Brutus had also been defeated. But Brutus's soldiers then attacked uh, Augustus's men and captured the camp of Antony and Augustus. Um, so it's a slightly different take uh, on Augustus saying, I defeated them twice in battle, considering that his men were actually defeated uh, by Brutus. Um, in Augustus's autobiography, of which we have fragments, he even states that he'd arisen from his sickbed in order to absent himself from the camp on that day of the battle in response to a warning received by one of his friends in a dream. So Augustus spins this as an, um, oh, the gods sent me a special warning to get out of the way. Um, however, it's difficult to see how he can then claim to have won the battle when he was actually uh, lurking in a marsh, according to Pliny the Elder. <laughs> Um, and again, the second battle, which appears mainly to have been Antony, the hero uh, fighting, uh, ends up with the suicide of Brutus. Now, John Scheidt, in his um, recent commentary of, of the Res Gestae, says, no, no, this isn't a lie, because technically um, Augustus could claim these victories as his own because they were fought under his auspices. But I still find it a little bit dodgy, to say the least, to talk entirely about, I defeated them, when it looks like he actually wasn't even there. Um, the other instance, which I think shows um, Augustus uh, playing fast and loose with, loose with the truth, is where he talks about bringing the sea under control from the pirates. Um, so, of course, we're going, well, who are these pirates? Um, this is Sextus Pompey, and it's identifiable because Augustus then talks about um, the slaves, um, under the terms of the treaty struck between the Triumvirs and Pompey in 39 BC, um, Sextus Pompey undertook not to provide refuge for runaway slaves anymore, and the slaves who had served in his fleet were to be granted their freedom. So Augustus records how he handed over 30,000 slaves to their masters, um, and just happens to forget to mention that he also crucified a further 6,000 whose masters couldn't be identified. He also happens to admit the fact that Augustus himself then went on to recruit slaves when he was a bit short of manpower in 38 BC. Um, and of course, all this is playing with the, the, the bogeyman of the slave war, the images of Spartacus. This is a real way to say that your enemy is beyond the pale if he's recruiting slaves to his, um, to his forces. So poor old Sextus Pompey ends up as a pirate in a slave war, um, not the son of Pompey the Great, uh, prescribed by the triumvirs, um, but also um, actually given a formal position by the Senate, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute. So from the coinage of the time, we can actually see that Pompey had this official title, um, prefect or commander of the fleet, and the coasts, and this was bestowed on him officially by the Senate. So far from being a pirate, he was actually entrusted by the Senate with being a, a, an official commander. Um, in referring to Sextus Pompey as a pirate, Augustus 
implicitly transforms his personal struggle for supremacy into a noble defence of Italy. He conceals the fact that Pompey was supported by several prescribed nobles, including, of course, Livia's first husband, Tiberius Nero, which I think is a lovely irony. Um, Augustus could avoid having to declare war officially by claiming to be fighting against pirates, because under Roman law, if the enemy um, was a, a robber or a bandit, um, you didn't have to declare war officially. Um, the ultimate irony of this, of course, is that Pompey the Great, his father, uh, famously rid the Mediterranean of pirates in just 40 days in 67 BC. And I can't help feeling that Augustus is really thumbing his nose at Sextus Pompey by referring to him as just another pirate. Uh, the final twist on the truth is in referring to the fact that he has built the Temple of Jupiter Ferretrius on the Capitol. Um, the Temple of Jupiter Ferretrius was, of course, founded by Romulus uh, to celebrate his victory over Akron, whom he'd killed in single combat, and it was considered the oldest temple in Rome. And Augustus rebuilt it in 31 BC, following advice from Pomponius Atticus. But because Augustus wanted to be seen as a new founder of Rome, a second Romulus, um, this is, I think, what leads him to make this claim that he simply built the temple of Jupiter Ferretrius rather than uh, rebuilt. And in the Reis Gestae, there, there is otherwise uh, a close consideration to uh, whether something is built or rebuilt. So overall, my sort of main way of interpreting the Reis Gestae is to get away from the idea that it can't lie, to treat it more on a par with the literary text, to think about questions of authorship, of intertextuality, uh, certainly not to accept it at face value. Uh, in the Reis Gestae, Augustus is at pains to present his career as legitimate um, and with himself acting in traditional and constitutional ways. But at the same time, he wants to give the impression that he is exceptional. He is exceptionally central to Rome's continuing prosperity, that he has somehow a unique role in creating a dialogue with the gods, and that he has been the first person to extend the boundaries of Roman power to the ends of the earth. So what I want to do now, um, briefly, is just do a quick flick through some of the recent uh, scholarship on, on Augustus more, more generally, uh, just to give you a, 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 some pointers where you could go. Um, so I, I'm hoping you're already familiar with the Lactor series of source books. Um, so my husband, who works at Warwick School, is in charge of editing these. And The Age of Augustus Lactor is a source book um, with literary texts, inscriptions, coins, papyri, in translation with brief comments. So it's an incredibly useful teaching resource. Um, then, to, not to spare my blushes, uh, my commentary of the race guest I is, I still, I still think, <laughs> the go-to place to go. And I, I have actually met a lot of students um, who say, oh, thank goodness for your commentary, because we know if we, if we learn what's in it, we can do our gobbets. Um, so I think, please do uh, consider consulting that if you haven't already. You may not be aware, though, that I've also done um, an Augustus annotated bibliography for the Oxford Online Bibliographies in 2014. And this basically is a summary of, I think I was asked to do 10,000 words, and I ended up doing 20,000 words. <laughs> and of course, it's <laughs> online, so it doesn't matter, of summarizing um, thematically all the most important scholarship in Augustus. And, and it's a wonderful cheat sheet because it gives you a, a quick 50-word synopsis of everything. Um, so I, I recommend that as a, as a place for bibliography up to 2014. Um, in terms of what I regard as the most helpful things for my students, and I guess for teaching as well, uh, Ronald Ridley's mon monograph uh, of 2003, this was the, the really important message of this work was to challenge the idea that the race guest I couldn't lie. And he goes through it in a lot of detail, uh, dissecting it, comparing it with other sources. And to be honest, I have sneaked um, some of his material in my lecture today. 
Um, I also recommend Carl Galinsky's Cambridge Companion to the Age of Augustus, um, just because it gives a fantastic overview of all sorts of um, themes by an international team of scholars. Um, particularly, it's got useful resources like suggestions for further readings, family trees, which is notoriously difficult, uh, timelines, and it's got some fantastic illustrations. Uh, likewise, Jonathan Edmondson's Edinburgh Readings volume is incredibly good, not least because he has in translation some um, otherwise completely inaccessible um, French and German articles. Um, so, unfortunately, I'd ploughed through Ferrari's article in French before I discovered it had been translated, and I felt really stupid after that. Um, but it's really, really important contributions. Um, and what's more is John has done uh, a sort of an explanation at the beginning of each section saying why these are really important contributions to the study of the age of Augustus. Um, of all these sort of little introductions to Augustus that are out there, my personal favourite is Carl Galinsky's CUP uh, 2012 volume. And the reason why I like this so much is that he, he doesn't, he doesn't s oversimplify things. Um, and he also includes little bits of source material that even I hadn't come across. Um, and he has little boxes of, of evidence and discusses them. Um, so in terms of encouraging students or, or teachers to develop a toolkit of analytical approaches, if you read through Galinsky's wonderful volume, I think that gives you um, some hints and tips. Um, then just to bring you up to date on things since 2014, um, first of all, I've put on here uh, the abstract of an article which I've got forthcoming in JRS, which should be out in November, which you'll be pleased to hear basically tries to deconstruct the whole idea of there being an Augustan principate. Um, because I, 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 I think, again, that thinking in terms of Augustus as emperor, as somehow establishing a new political regime, is very much something that we come to with the benefit of hindsight. Um, what I argue is that from the contemporaries, what they thought was that he was somehow a man with unique uh, powers, unique charisma, who was somehow predestined by the gods to be a ruler. And it wasn't about setting up a new political system called the Principate. It was about him um, being an amazing individual. And of course, this then generates huge problems for Tiberius, because how do you follow that? Um, Penny Goodman has got a fantastic uh, review article in last year's JRS where she reviews 12 recent books inspired by the bimillennium of Augustus's death in 20, 2014. So if you want to get a sense of um, new approaches to the age of Augustus, that's a very good go-to. Um, Mary Harlow and Ray's, uh, Ray Lawrence, um, I put this on because as a particular favourite of mine because it emphasises... Um, the declining years of Augustus, and I think we tend to think of him in this prima porta, uh, endless, youthful appearance. And they point out the challenges of Augustus's final years. And um, when I heard them do this as a paper, they had a wonderful mock-up of the prima porta with an aging Augustus. And if we had more images like that, I think it would change our view of just quite how influential he was able to be. And then I'm also giving you uh, advance warning of a book that will be out in the autumn by OUP called The Alternative Augustan Age, um, where the aim of this book is to get away from thinking that Augustus is the answer to everything. Um, and in particular, I've, I've just summarised for you um, the three uh, really important chapters in there. But it's emphasising that we shouldn't talk about the age of Augustus only in terms of the agency of what Augustus himself was up to that individuals like Agrippa, who traditionally is talked about as, oh, he's Augustus's right-hand man, that Agrippa was actually a really important figure in his own right. And then finally, um, you may have seen uh, Pandy, um, her book on the poetics of power in Augustan Rome, which I think is a fabulous contribution um, in l integrating literature and um, material culture, uh, visual culture from Augustan Rome. And in many ways, she's taking Zanka uh, and doing something new with the visual material. So again, I, I've put on there the quick synopsis of her monograph. So I'm aware that's a very quick skip through, 
but hopefully it'll save you hours of trawling through things just to know um, some of the most useful things, I think, that are out there. So I'll stop there. Um, we could have a couple of questions, if there are any. <laughs> yes, thanks. The, um, at the outset, the mock-up of the mausoleum. Yes. Um, the red gas lighting's really small. I, I imagine <laughs> it's not really... Yeah. Maybe I'm just <laughs> yes, well, I mean, uh, no, because I think the way Mussolini has it displayed outside the Areparchus is that the lettering is really legible and very big, whereas I imagine it would have been like a centimetre high. Um, so, yes, you've got one, this is probably column A and then column B. Um, so, I think, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So, I think, yeah, if you want to look at it, you'd have to go right up to it. Um, but again, for me, I think the important thing is to remember that um, there were annual sacrifices, annual festivities at the mausoleum, where I think, you know, on the anniversary of Augustus's death through the ages, people would have been there and probably people would have said, oh, look, there's, yeah, there's the raised guest die sort of thing. Um, but actually, probably people wouldn't have been going and reading the text in any detail. But yeah, good point. Um, it's, yeah, no, it's not, it's not that, it's on, it's on the wall of the temple, but it's, it's not huge. I mean, the, the lettering is quite small again. Um, the, the title is big, so you can see what it is, but, you know, who's going to stand there reading? I mean, any, yeah, idiots like me <laughs> would actually stand in front of an inscription trying to read it. Um, I have no, no doubts that people just... Yeah, just the visual effect of it was there and it was it was looking impressive. Or shall I? Oh yeah, that's. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, when did he start calling it the mausoleum? So Strabo, Strabo. yeah. Strabo. So so he's late Augustan, early Tiberian. Um, so otherwise, it was called the Tumulus of the Caesars. Yeah. I think in Virgil six, and he had six. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it's called. So it is interesting that the contemporaries are calling it the mausoleum as well. Yeah. Of course, sorry, just to say, of course, Strobo comes from the Greek East, so it may be that that's his take on it as well.